Welcome to the third and final video on network security. In video one, we looked at the importance of network security, and the second video broke down each threat and identified possible motivations for mounting an attack. In this video, we focus on threat prevention or mitigation. For each threat, you need to demonstrate that you understand how to prevent or limit damage to the network. At GCSE, they often give you a scenario with a fictitious company, often hilariously containing the exam board's name. And then, in some way, you've got to show that you understand what the threat is, why someone would do it, how it's carried out, and finally, how you can prevent it. It's worth being precise at this point and making sure that you understand the difference between threat prevention and damage mitigation. Take the case of a DDoS attack. It is impossible to stop someone carrying out this kind of attack. However, it may be possible to put measures in place that limit the impact of the attack so that the network is still accessible and usable. Let's go through each threat one by one and identify the prevention method. If you're taking notes, you may want to create a table with one column for threat, another for how it's carried out, and then columns for motive and prevention. You can use a mind map as well, it works really well. Let's get to it. Let's begin with malicious code or malware. This story starts with malicious code being introduced into a network either from being transferred across the network, for example, by a user opening a link on a website or opening an email attachment. This serves to execute the malicious code, the virus replicates, spreads and threatens the safety of the network. Malware may also be introduced from transferring the malicious code from removable media, for example, a USB flash drive that a user inserts into the USB port or any other physical storage device for that matter. Notice the twin dangers of physical and logical electronic threats. When you're answering these questions, keep in mind, especially for the longer questions, that you consider the logical and physical methods of attack, as well as the logical and physical methods of prevention. This opens up more possibilities for your answers and give you the chance to score more marks. Now that we know how malicious code may be introduced to a network, we need to focus on how to prevent that from happening. As I just mentioned, there's a physical and a logical angle to answer this question. The physical solution would be to ban the use of USB flash drives, therefore ensuring that people cannot introduce viruses to the network from a physical device. Limiting the number of ways in which malicious code can be introduced to a network is, of course, effective in reducing potential security threats. It also serves to eradicate the possibility of people copying sensitive data onto a USB storage device and then losing it or selling it to the highest bidder. Such stories of sensitive data being lost are commonplace. In 2008, top secret documents containing the security service's latest intelligence on a terrorist cell were left on a commuter train. Not exactly ideal. The logical approach to malware would be to install anti-malware software, to ban or to limit the access to certain websites where malicious code is more likely to exist. Notice that I mentioned anti-malware software and not antivirus software. And that's because, strictly speaking, anti-malware software will mitigate against adware, ransomware, as well as viruses. You must also ensure that virus definitions are kept up to date. Now, that last sentence needs a little bit of unpicking. You may be asking, what are virus definitions? In order for antivirus software to function effectively, the software needs to know which files pose a threat to the network. And this is where virus definitions come in. The company that produces anti-malware creates a list of virus definitions on a regular basis. 
These definitions are uploaded to the database in your computer's antivirus software. The anti-malware software scans the files that enter your computer or network. It compares these files to the files listed in the virus definitions. When there's a positive match, that file will be deleted or in some cases quarantined for the user to decide next steps. Now, antivirus software has become more sophisticated and now some antivirus softwares monitor the behavior of files, especially when the behavior is suspicious. So keeping these definitions up to date is vitally important because of course viruses are released on a daily basis. So even the most up to date virus definitions are only a list of viruses that have been discovered so far. It can't look into the future. Now that we know how to protect your network against malware, let's move on to brute force attacks. These have been a popular source of questions across the exam boards over the years. We discussed how brute force attacks occur. The good news is that you already know how to prevent them. Why? Because you set up dozens of new accounts each time you go on the internet, and these accounts spell out, insist, how a password should be constructed. So the first way of mitigating against a brute force attack is to make the password difficult to guess. Passwords should be made up of more than eight characters or be sufficiently long to make them hard or harder to crack. They should be a combination of lower and uppercase letters and numbers and special characters. Passwords should not be made up of words that you'd find in a dictionary. And that's because the software that's used to carry out brute force attacks relies on a, a version of an online dictionary. So using real words or common words makes your password far easier to guess. The second prevention method is to only allow a certain number of unsuccessful attempts to enter the network before that user is blocked. This, of course, limits the chances of the password being guessed successfully because there are only a limited number of guessing opportunities that the would-be attacker actually has. There are also physical means of preventing brute force attacks and that's two-factor authentication, biometric access methods or using smart cards to access the system. Now, in these examples, this two-factor, something physical is required as well as the piece of knowledge the piece of knowledge is the password, of course, and you need both to enter the system. And that's the physical logical divide again. Let's look at SQL injections next. We know these attacks occur when a user adds additional SQL commands into a data input form, which gets put into a database. The mitigation technique is known as data validation. This means cleansing the data input into a form before allowing it to enter the system. Now, broadly, there are two validation techniques, whitelisting and blacklisting. Let's look at whitelisting first. Whitelisting involves only allowing the data that you know is trustworthy to enter the network. An example would be only accepting a telephone number with 11 digits, because if this number has more than 11 digits or fewer, it's not a phone number. Blacklisting has a different approach. This involves refusing entry to certain types of data that you know will have a negative impact. So for example, certain SQL strings or commands which are known to form part of an SQL attack can be outlawed. Phishing, another threat that bears a physical and a logical side, and it's got a physical and a logical solution as well. In a phishing scam, users are the weak point. So a physical solution would be to regularly train staff to recognize phishing scams and to equip them to avoid being tricked into giving information away. So for example, reminding staff to only click on attachments from recognized senders or to advise staff to be aware of people around them or new devices on their machines when they're entering passwords. The logical approach here would involve banning access to certain websites or domains, probably using a firewall. A good acceptable use policy would also contain this type of information and users should be encouraged to sign it before being allowed network access. DDoS attacks are complex in nature and require a multifaceted approach to prevention. Monitoring software should be installed on the system. This software 
constantly scans the network for unusual activity and acts as an early warning system against DDoS attacks. This gives the network manager more time to mitigate against the attack. Firewalls, VPN, anti-spam software and content filtering all form part of the defense against DDoS attacks. Network forensics takes place in the aftermath of an attack and involves forensically examining how the attack unfolded in order to learn lessons and improve security against subsequent attacks. It's a bit like an inquiry that takes place after a, a tragic accident where lives have been lost. The aim of this approach is to enable the network manager to adapt the DDoS mitigation measures so that they are even more robust going forwards into the future. The last attack to mitigate against is the so-called man-in-the-middle attack, the data interception. The most efficient way to mitigate against this threat is to encrypt the data before it's sent. This involves turning plain text into cipher text and this renders the data useless to a would-be attacker because it's unreadable. So that's it. You should now have a solid grip of this topic. Go back over the video and make sure that you've got good notes or mind maps or tables or index cards that you can revise from and periodically go back to refresh your memory. You will thank me later on for this. If you found this video useful, please hit the like button and don't forget to subscribe if you want to be the first to find out about the latest videos to help you crack your computer science GCSE. Bye bye.